Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Birkbeck to this uh, lecture um, um, at the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. I'm David Feldman. I'm the uh, director of the Institute. Uh, this is a very special lecture. Uh, as some of you will know, last year was full of events and lectures and exhibitions marking the 500th anniversary of the Venice Ghetto. This, however, is one of the very few events which is marking the 501st <laughs> anniversary of the Venice Ghetto. Um, and helping us uh, do so, um, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Professor Shaul Bassi from uh, Kafoskari University in Venice. Shaul is professor of English there, and his research interests include Shakespeare and Jewish studies. He is co-founder and Italian president of, of a Beit, a Venezia, a home for Jewish culture, and he coordinated the committee for the 500th anniversary of the Ghetto of Venice. His recent publications include Shakespeare in Venice, Exploring the City with Shylock and Othello, and Shakespeare's Italy, and Italy's Shakespeare, Place, Race, and Politics. Um, in um, um, organizing uh, this evening's lecture and in organizing a symposium on the history of ghettos, which we have at the Institute tomorrow, um, I've been working in partnership with uh, Professor Brian Chayette from the University of Reading and my colleague here at Birkbeck, Professor uh, Filippo De Vivo. Um, uh, Filippo, unlike me, is distinguished by the fact that he actually knows something about the history of Venice. <laughs> and um, so it will be entirely appropriate that he and not I comes and chairs the, uh, 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 the opportunity that uh, you will have to um, ask um, questions and make comments after Shaul's lecture, and Filippo will give a vote of thanks at the end. However, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Shaul Bassi, who will talk on the ghetto of Venice, past, present, future. Shaul, thank you, sir. I think you took my talk. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Feldman. Uh, uh, as you just heard, this is the end of a very long and eventful, intense year for me. To some extent, is the light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, I'm so grateful for the invitation. Um, so thank you to the Pears Institute. Thank you to uh, David Feldman and to my uh, colleagues Brian Chayette and Filippo De Vivo. Their work has inspired me in my uh, different interests. Uh, and I'm also very happy to be here with a lot of uh, colleagues that are going to uh, talk about the ghettos uh, tomorrow, um, and in particular, Mitchell Dunier, who uh, has inspired a lot of my thinking. Um, in 1516, uh, the Republic of Venice decreed that the Jews of the city, most of them newcomers and refugees, should be confined to one peripheral square that was an abandoned metal copper foundry called Getto. So I would like to start from an axiom formulated by uh, scholars Roger Friedland whoops, and Richard Echt in their study of the cultures of sacred places. And their axiom is central places, holy places, sacred places, memory places, are those in which time is concentrated, thickened. They are places where the beginning of time presses into the present, and the present bleeds into the end of time. 
beginning and end are there. But central places, holy places, sacred places, and memory places are intensely present. And my claim is that the ghetto fits this description really well. Peripheral in the topography of the city, the ghetto of Venice is a central place, a sacred place, and a memory place. And it is a very, very small place. May I ask how many people have been to the ghetto of Venice in this room? Yes, I, oh wow, all right, okay, so, that's good. Um, it takes less than five minutes to walk its breadth and length. Uh, I'm sure that some of you that I've heard it many times, is that all? You know, one comes with a lot of expectation and it's all concentrated there. And it is then deeply ironical that this cramped area has given its name to thousands of areas around the world. That a neglected area of northern Venice has become, to quote Mitchell Dunier's illuminating study, an idea. So in this place, to go back to Friedland Necht, the beginning of time presses into the present, and the present bleeds into the end of time. 2016 was an exceptional year, with great expectations and deep anxiety over the idea of celebrating a site of oppression, the city marked 500 years of existence of the ghetto as a focal point of Jewish life in Venice and beyond. It was a concerted effort championed by the historic Jewish community of Venice and endorsed by the city and all its major political and cultural institutions. It was a unique occasion to revisit the past in multiple symposia, uh, to present it to large audiences with official ceremonies, major exhibitions, and artistic reimaginings, and crucially to envision its future. At a time of crisis and uncertainty for the city, for Europe, and the world. <coughs> So in this light, I'd like to slightly modify the order of my subtitle. So it's no longer the ghetto past, present, and future, but it's the ghetto present, past, and future, because um, we need to start from the intense present to understand the past. It is our present perceptions of the ghetto that guide our interpretations of the past and orient us towards the future. I'm going to comment on a few images this is one of the many, many reportages that were made of the ghetto this year. Uh, um, this is a wonderful uh, picture by the Bosnian photographer, Zia Gafic, who in this shot captures three defining elements of the present. What you see here is an uh, orthodox, ultra-orthodox uh, Lubavitcher Jew with his smartphone or some tablet, I don't know. So in a nice balance of tradition and modernity in an otherwise empty square. Um, and then you see on the background um, one of the two Holocaust memorials that remain to this day the only uh, example of public art that is available in the ghetto. So, and then there is a green booth that would not say much, except that is the uh, uh, permanent police post that reminds us that, um, to some extent, the ghetto is also a sensitive zone that needs to be policed 24-7. What does this picture suggest? It suggests that the ghetto is characterized by three elements that are certainly there, but that create some, let's say, analogy with other places. The presence of the Lubavitcher uh, makes a sort of, creates a sort of analogy between the ghetto and other closely neat ultra-Orthodox communities that one is more likely to find in Brooklyn or in Jerusalem, and the Holocaust Memorial with the barbed wire on top of the wall creates a direct analogy with the ghettos of Eastern Europe. And it's at this point that I would like to quote Mitchell Dunier's uh, book, Ghetto, History of an Idea, where he says eloquently, in failing to contrast places such as Warsaw under the Nazis with the famous ghettos of the early modern era, 
Social scientists missed a golden opportunity to develop a way of thinking about the ghetto that does more than highlight the amount and consequences of segregation. They missed a chance to give due recognition to the variations in both flourishing and social control that are found in wherever people are restricted in space. Calling Venice and Warsaw by the same name without drawing some distinctions between them paints over these kinds of crucial differences rather than elucidating them and helping us to understand them." End of quote. So the Holocaust Memorial that was installed in 1980 marked the transformation of the ghetto into a site of memory, a civic arena where the key public moments, the seminal stories of Italian anti-fascism and multiculturalism, unfold in ceremonies and demonstrations where sometimes tension also emerges between the anti-fascist and anti-Zionist sentiments of certain segments of the left. And the Lubavitcher came in the late 1980s. So something that has characterized the very recent life of the ghetto has become, to some extent, its uh, international image. In her commentary on this picture, CNN journalist, this was uh, a service for National Geographic and then was picked up by CNN, where the journalist writes something like, all Guffich found was an overwhelming silence, an element that became central to the photographs he made there. The point is that Guffich, who is from Sarajevo, wanted to find silence and came to take photographs of the ghetto at six in the morning, because that was his own image of the place, which, if you have visited, is one of the most crowded and noisy places in the city. But for Gafic, it was important to project his own memories of war in Sarajevo to this place, to give the place a kind of metaphorical interpretation. <laughs> so this is a very important reminder of how in Venice, Many ghettos, real and metaphorical, are superimposed on the real one. The ghetto of Venice, one could argue, is never just the ghetto of Venice. And the interference of other ghettos, of other historical realities, is not enough. What about the fact that there is another fictional presence that is haunting the ghetto? This is how the Times reported on the campaign run by the Jewish community to restore the Jewish Museum and the five uh, Renaissance and Baroque synagogues that are still there. They called it Shylock's Ghetto. And I don't think there's any um, need here to remind you of why. Because whether one likes it or not, the most famous Venetian Jew of all times is likely to remain Shylock. Um, created by William Shakespeare that never set foot in Venice, never set foot in the ghetto, and yet must have heard about it. So the ghetto of Venice is never just the ghetto of Venice. So when it was decided to mark the 500th anniversary, some people were very, very concerned. Are you going to celebrate? Are you going to glorify the ghetto? As the most vocal critic of this uh, program, wrote, the ghetto was a phenomenon of eternal exile, 300 years of segregation for a mass of people branded by the mark of difference who were prevented from living full lives like every other human being. This is what one might call uh, the lacrimose version of Jewish history. Uh, the narrative that was adopted by the committee was a more nuanced one that didn't want to play down the elements of segregation, but also played a lot of emphasis on Jewish agency, what the Jews could achieve in the ghetto because of those unique conditions and because uh, uh, of the restriction that, that were imposed on them. So um, the burden of the ghetto, one might call it, is that is also its potential. And I would suggest at this point that one should think of the ghetto as a fundamentally ambivalent document of civilization, having been both an instrument of intolerance and a catalyst of cross-cultural understanding 
a vehicle of anti-Semitism and a portal of knowledge uh, on the Jews. So I apologize, I apologize for this long preamble, but I think it's very important to point how, how uh, in my experience, it's very little to have a kind of innocent view of this place. There are so many layers that needs to be unraveled to uh, have a better understanding of the place. So now, having started from the presence, I'm going to walk you through the past and I'm going to cover a lot of ground, so forgive me for being uh, superficial and of course I'm very happy to have questions at the end to perhaps clarify a few points. So this is a very, very um, sketchy timeline. 1516 is when the ghetto was officially constituted. It remained a segregated area until 1797 when Napoleon's troops came and uh, destroyed the gates. Um, Venice remained under France briefly and under the Austro-Hungarian Empire until 1866 when it became an Italian city, it joined the Kingdom of Italy. And between 1866 and 1938 was the moment where Venetian Jews had a long time of emancipation and hope of being fully integrated Italian citizens. And that lasted until 1938 when the racist laws, sometimes they're called race laws, they were racist laws issued by the fascist regime, re-segregated the Jews and um, provoked their deportation in 1943 and 1944. And then last year, 2016, key moment to take stock of the past and imagine the future. So, uh, just to go into more detail on some of these uh, periods, I decided to do something um, a little bit uh, special. I've decided to talk about four different times, uh, four different periods by way of connecting them to four people that are on my family tree. Um, to some extent, my family have been newcomers to the ghetto. They came only 200 years ago. If we follow just, uh, there are other people in Venice they'll tell you they, you know, they go way back. Uh, but then I can also claim an ancestor of sorts that was there right at the beginning. So just to help you see more through the lens of the individual, this uh, long history, allow me to um, this little um, sort of device, as it were. And my first character is a man called Josef Pardo, who um, was there in the 16th century. So in the first century of the ghetto existence. In uh, 1516, um, the Venice Senate decreed that the Jews who had fled to the city a few years earlier, after the defeat at the Battle of Agnadello, from the main body of the city. It was decided to confine them to the former public copper foundry, Getto del Rame del Nostro Comun, used in the past to manufacture ordnance, and that was a way of securing the service of the Jews by keeping them safely at the margins. Until then, Jews had been permitted to work in Venice, but not to reside in it on a permanent basis. My ancestor was born sometime in the mid 16th century in Salonika in Greece, as part of the Ottoman Empire, a member of that massive Sephardic diaspora expelled from Spain in 1492. This is a family tree of the Pardo family that ends with some scribble notes that connected to my grandmother. But what's interesting is that it may not be clear that no single member, no single person in this family tree that includes only the men, um, is born and dies in the same place. It starts in Castilla, Castilla, Salonico, Saloniki, Amsterdam, Amsterdam, Jerusalem, Amsterdam, Skopje, Skopje, Split, Split, Dubrovnik, Dubrovnik, Venice, Jerusalem, with London, Suriname, Hamburg, and Curaçao on the other branches. So, sometime in the 1580s, Josef Pardo decides to leave Saloniki and move to Venice. We don't know his individual motivations, but we know that he chose 
to go there and to join a relatively new Jewish community that was in fact a very diverse mosaic of different Jewish traditions, Italian, German, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, and descendants of the Maranos who had converted in Spain and went to Venice to return to Judaism. So that mosaic, that diverse community, uh, numbered three to 5,000 at the peak of the ghetto. So this is a map of Venice, and you can see that the ghetto um, is up north, very far from the center, from San Mark. They were given the ghetto, the foundry, and it may have been the incoming German Jews who mispronounced the G of the ghetto and turned it into the ghetto. Out there, there are a lot of alternative etymologies that are very creative but have no historical ground. <laughs> Other Jewish isolated areas have existed before, so technically the ghetto is not the first ghetto, but fact remains that in 1555, Pope Paul IV decided to model new segregated Jewish quarters in the papal state uh, after this Venetian area. From there, the name ghetto started spreading in space and time to other ethnic enclaves and countless other physical, psychological, and metaphorical forms of limitation and confinement. And once again, I refer you to a beautiful book by Mitchell Dunier, The Ghetto History of an Idea. Constrained within the narrow limits of an island, the ghetto became at once a place of segregation and a safe haven for refugees, arguably one of the best compromises in Europe at the time. The Jews had been expelled from England centuries before. From Spain recently, they were persecuted in, in Germany. So when the Jews entered the ghetto, the rents immediately skyrocketed, and they had to become very creative. They could never own any property there. They were renting from Christian landlords. And blocks became taller, and the headroom in apartments much lower. Six or seven story buildings had to accommodate as many as 10 apartments. The new arrivals were given permission to build their place of worship as long as they were not immediately recognizable from outside, which explains why the older Venetian synagogues are incorporating into residential buildings. One can walk through the ghetto today and failing to notice the existence of the synagogues. And this is also a fascinating aspect of the ghetto. It's the one square in Venice that, number one, has no churches, which explains why it was chosen, and number two, has no arresting facade. You know, in Venice, you stop all the time because you see a beautiful facade. None of that is available there. It is quite likely that Rabbi, Yosef Pardo chose the ghetto that at the time of his arrival had added a second smaller square for other reasons. Despite the strict regulation which forbade Jews to leave the area from sunset to sunrise and prescribed the wearing of a yellow badge during daylight excursions, the ghetto saw considerable incoming and outgoing traffic and became a vivacious social and cultural melting point with five main synagogues three pawn shops where German and Italian Jews were licensed to lend money, uh, shops, study halls, orchards, many, many animals. There's a beautiful documentary that was made last year where you learned that there were 1,700 geese roaming around the ghetto. You know, that's, it was and has been described as a mini civilization, a real city within the city. That provided, among other things, a positive theological response to Henry VIII on his divorce from Catherine of Aragon, helped the rabbis of Amsterdam to build their community, enabled the publication in Venice of one third of all the Hebrew books printed in Europe, including the first complete edition of the Talmud. Many of these cultural achievements, like the Hebrew books printed by Christians or the synagogues designed by Christian architects, were collaborative enterprises. So that's another paradox, one might say, that the most Jewish things you find in the ghetto were also part of a kind of dialogue 
conversation. The Jews could not be, were not allowed to be architects, were not allowed to be printers, they were restricted to very few professions. Hence, they went out to seek the services of these people who were very happy to make money out of the Jews. Pardo was a member of the second wave of Jews, Sephardim coming from Spain to return to Judaism, or uh, people who had left Spain in 1492 and had temporarily relocated to the Levant, the East, in Greece and the Ottoman Empire. And this is the Levantine synagogue where he served as rabbi. And it's still in use today. Some of you may have visited it. In 1601, Pardo wanted to publish a new commentary on the Torah consisting of literal interpretations called from the works of other classical commentators. And the work of preparing the commentary was given to the most famous intellectual of the ghetto, Rabbi Leon Modena. One of the leading figures in Jewish cultural life in Venice, a scientist and a theologian, a great preacher and author of an autobiography, Life of Yehuda, Modena was a reference point for his community and far beyond it. Uh, Leon Modena is famous because in many ways, but also he left this very accurate description of life in the ghetto and, uh, uh, and had so many different occupations because he had a gambling problem. And so all the money he made by you know, writing books or teaching or preaching, he would squander in, in the gambling house. But... Crucially, Leon Modena is also, or needs to be remembered, as the author of the first work written in the vernacular by a Jew with the aim of acquainting Christian readers with Jewish customs. Historia de Riti Ebraici, a history of Hebrew rites, was probably commissioned by the English ambassador Henry Wotton and written for King James I, while Shakespeare was still alive though it wasn't actually published until 1637. So every introduction to Judaism today, to some extent, is beholden to the work of Leon Modena. Jewish intellectuals such as Modena should be fully recognized as participants of the larger phenomenon that we refer to commonly as the Italian Renaissance. And the symbiosis between Jewish and secular learning that he embodied is epitomized by his poem that was produced here that he composed as a teenager in memory of one of his teachers. The poetry lines, whether you read them in Hebrew or in Italian, they are not a translation of each other. They sound the same and they mean the same. So he was able to write two poems that not only meant the same, but sound the same using different words in Hebrew and Italian. So that's really, uh, to me, a great um, example of how, for this intellectual, it would be perfectly normal to be fully versed in traditional Jewish learning, but also to uh, be fully versed in the Renaissance culture of, of Venice. And it is Leon Modena himself who tells us that my ancestor, Josef Pardo, went bankrupt in his enterprise and left Venice and went to Amsterdam where he joined and became a rabbi there in a Bet Yaakov congregation. And I wonder uh, if Raf Pardo ever met with the other extraordinary character from the ghetto, a woman called Sarah Kopia Sulam, the daughter of a prominent Sephardic merchant who with an extraordinary degree of self-confidence as a woman, and as a Jewish woman in particular, published poetry, drama, philosophy, resisting any plea to conversion, and defending herself in print on a number of uh, debates. At some point, she was accused of denying the immortality of the soul, a very dangerous accusation for both Christian and Jews, because of the fact that she had opened a what we would call a salon, an academy in the ghetto. So we're talking about, let me emphasize that, we're talking about the early 17th century, a Jewish woman who opens her house to Jewish and Christian intellectuals and have them engage in conversation on the most in, uh, current cultural and philosophical matters. 
And the fact that she was silenced early on, she published that manifesto where she defended herself from the accusation, but at a very young age, she was silenced. And so I want you to remember her because she will come back at the end of this talk as, to me, as a symbol of the future of, of the ghetto. It's time to flash forward and to move to the other end of the era of ghettoization. We, Napoleon has come, he has liberated the Jews. And this is a man called Momolo Mandolin. Momolo is the Venetian version of Jerome, Girolamo. And he was my grandfather's grandfather. And I choose him because he represents the ghetto in the 19th century, because he was not a famous person. He was a very, very ordinary uh, uh, resident of the ghetto. And he was part of a group of Ashkenazi Jews from we don't know where, who decided to make the ghetto their home right at the time when it was opened when the Jews of Venice gained their civic rights. The archive of Venice, there are some historians amongst you, it's a very interesting place to do research work. This is uh, a list of the people, um, the members of the community. This is the selection of my ancestors. So the Bassi, these are the first Bassi that came and Abram, Mose, Abram, Girolamo, Sabato, Samuel. Um, most of them are listed, that's the list of our professions, are listed as industriante. It's again quite ironical because industriante, 19th century Italian, might mean industrialist, but it basically meant unemployed. <laughs> and, or, to use an Yiddish alternative translation, schnorrer. You know, they were probably people living uh, poor Jews living off the more affluent Jews who had left the ghetto as soon as it was permissible to live in other parts of the city. <coughs> Endowed with new freedoms, rich capitals, and great social energy that had been you know, pent up in the ghetto, the more affluent Jews bought the palazzos from the dilapidated Venetian aristocracy and became prominent and active members of Venetian society. We have a nice sketch of the Jewish community from the American consul who lived in Venice uh, during the Austrian occupation in the 1860s. And he uses a Shakespearean metaphor to describe the current relations between Jews and Christians. And he says, Shylock is dead. If he lived, Antonio would hardly spit upon his gorgeous pantaloons or his Parisian coat as he met him on the Rialto. He would far rather call out to him, Cho Shylock Bondi, go piacer vederla, which means Shylock, good day, glad to see you. So, a great historical example of the new condition of the Jews is that of a man called Isacco Pesaro Mauro Gonato who was a patriot, uh, an economist, who was part of the Venetian, first Venetian uprising against the Austrians, and was offered the first post as Minister of Finance of the newly created state of Italy. So a Venetian Jew was asked to be a Minister of Finance of uh, Italian state, which shows the, the extent of the emancipation. But, as soon as that position was offered, an anti-Semitic campaign started against him. And he himself decided to turn down that offer because he said that the first job of an Italian minister was to confiscate a lot of property from the church. And that was not a job that a Jewish person would probably have to be in charge of. Momolo Mandolin, my great, yeah, you know, my ancestor, um, certainly owned no Parisian coat and no gorgeous pantaloons. He was the first one who moved out of the ghetto. 
that remained the comfort zone for the Jews of Venice and raised his son to become a rabbi. And here I need to and I want to play tribute to Israel Zangwill, the one of the few writers who have captured the spirit of the ghetto and especially the difficult cultural and psychological transition from the ghetto to uh, open society, we would call it, from one world to another, from an enclosed Jewish area to the outer world with its promises and its threats. And some details in this description, like you know, iron gates, there were never iron gates in, in the ghetto, but he really captures, and it's so interesting that in his landmark collection, Dreamers of the Ghettos, he decides to tell the whole epic of Jewish emancipation by framing it with one initial and one final story set in Venice. The first one is A Child of the Ghetto, where he imagines a child that gets lost on Yom Kippur and leaves the ghetto of Venice and discovers St. Mark Square, and so he encounters uh, uh, the Christian society and secular society out there. But then there is this, the final story, Had Gadia, where he talks about the torments and the troubles of a modern Jewish intellectual that cannot find a balance between his Jewish identity and the new secular culture that he is absorbed in Vienna. So he goes back to Venice, he celebrates Passover, Pesach at home, and then he feels drawn back to that warm embrace. Why had his brethren ever sought to emerge from the joyous slavery of the ghetto? The joyous slavery of the ghetto. And now, you know, the end of the story, which is very tragic, shows that this is an incomplete transition. And now, I move to the 20th century to talk about my own grandfather. Girolamo, known as Gino, born in 1892, lived in London in 1910 because he was madly in love with England. And in 1916, he lost his father, who was the rabbi, and as an orphan, he was spared the trenches of World War I. And his name, does not appear on this plaque that's on the facade of the same Levantine synagogue where Pardo served as a rabbi in the 17th century. And this is the name of the names of the Italian Jews, the Venetian Jews, fallen for their homeland in Guerra per la Patria. It's interesting that the word homeland appears in the Italian, does not appear in the Hebrew. So in the Hebrew, it just say that they died in the war. But the, the, but nevertheless, this was perhaps the ultimate sacrifice shown to Italy to demonstrate that they were no longer Jews, first and foremost. They were Italians of Israelite religion. The list of surnames, Grunwald, Levi Morenos, Nakamulli, Navarro, Padova, Todesco, still evokes the multi-ethnic composition of the original Jewish community. But now, the mostly classical first names, uh, Guido, Alberto, Augusto, Umberto, and the common fate of having died in the war, was meant to communicate that they were really Italian, no doubt. Gino, married Lina Ravenna, who was a descendant of Josef Pardo. And that's how the mixed marriage between Ashkenazi and Sephardim happened in the early 20th century. Gino Bassi, my grandfather, was so sure of being fully integrated that like many other Italians, he even joined the fascist party. I know, that's exactly the kind of moment. <laughs> Whose nationalist agenda initially had no particular interest in the Jews. I hope some real neo-fascist buys the book thinking it is a revanchist book and finds out about the Shoah. This is my father explaining why he decided to put that picture on the cover of his 
memoir called Skirmishes of Lake Ladoga, my father is the small boy doing the fascist salute in the early 40s. My grandfather, who was a liberal, an Anglophile, my father is named Robert after Robert, Roberto, after Robert Browning, didn't like Mussolini, but as many Italians decided out of sheer convenience to join the party because of the uh, professional um, privileges that he would enjoy. He was not brave enough to fight fascism as many other Jews did. And of course, the number of active anti-fascists outranked the fascists in, in outnumbered the fascists among Jews. But it's still a bitter truth that needs to be faced that um, a lot of Jews felt that they could join the fascist party as a sign of loyalty towards Italy. That did not save my grandfather or his children from being hit by the race laws in 1938. October 1938, my father is seven, he goes to school, sits down, and the teacher comes in and says, there are enemies amongst us, they are an alien race, we have to expel them because they pollute the body of the nation, Roberto Bassi out. And my father at age seven discovered that he was an enemy of the state, which shocked the boy that was sitting next to him, that decades later told my father that he for years had nightmares about having been sitting next to the enemy of the state. Exclusion from the public sphere, the Jews were never put back in the ghetto, so this is very important to notice. You know, the Jews were socially segregated, but never put back in the ghetto. They were expelled from public schools for public jobs, but when they created a Jewish school where they could all go, it was not in the ghetto. Exclusion from the public sphere and the withdrawal of most civil rights paved the way for the mass arrests and deportations of the final years of World War II. In 1943, Germany invaded northern Italy after the fall of Mussolini, and 8,000 Italians and 200 uh, Italian Jews and 243 people from Venice were deported sent to Auschwitz, and only eight came back. Uh, many of them were the elderly people who lived in the old age home in the ghetto. My family survived, I'm here, because they went to Rome uh, seeking shelter with their cousins, who then, in fact, were the ones who got deported and never came back. The Bassi and the majority of the Venetian Jews survived, and this is a beautiful, moving picture of the Sefer Torah, the scrolls of the Torah, coming back in the ghetto uh, in the arms of, a, I think, a New Zealand uh, like, uh, officer. And all the people come out of hiding. Um, and in this story, it's very important to emphasize how for all the Jews who were saved, there were some known Jews who helped them. And for a lot of the Jews, who were, for all the Jews that were arrested, uh, there were some of their neighbors who denounced them. So for many years, Italy has cherished the myth of the good Italian. But no, Italians were also willing executioners, and many of them also helped saving the Jews. Approaching the end of my talk, this is my son, Samuel. And in 2012, I walk into his first day of school, and as you may expect, it was a very emotional moment, but it was made more special because when I walked through that ample Venetian courtyard, I was also seeing my father being expelled from the same school at the same age. So we're still there, and my son is went for his first years to the school where my father was intense for one day before he was expelled. And that brings us to the present and back to the present and to our century. An ave photographer, Fernando Shanna, 
uh, who has captured a few moments of the life, everyday life in the ghetto today. You see children. You see it's not an empty square by any means. You see children playing. You see the rabbi and some member of the congregation studying the Torah. You see the tall houses with a lot of you know, open windows. And children learning from a guide at the Jewish Museum. This really represents the everyday reality of the ghetto. And yet, the black and white of the photographs also somehow tinges them with nostalgia. Uh, Shanna is a photographer who specializes in religious rituals in traditional Italy. There is a sense that maybe he's capturing something that is going away. And at this point, and in conclusion, it's to me crucial to situate the condition of the ghetto in the wider context of the city with the help of a very thought-provoking book called If Venice Dies by Salvatore Settis, a very important cultural critic. And as you can see from the picture that he put on the American edition of the book, the main threat to Venice today is not the fact that it's sinking, but the fact that today is invested in what he calls a uh, rapacious tourist monoculture. Venice is becoming all about tourists and is spe specifically becoming about bringing more people for a shorter and shorter time to Venice. You know, so I've learned that people come on a cruise, stay for three hours, and then they live. And he says, if Venice dies, it won't be the only thing that dies, the very idea of the city as an open space where diversity and social life can unfold, as the supreme creation of our civilization, as a commitment to and promise of democracy, will also die with it. So preserving Venice is not just preserving a beautiful monument of the past, it's also preserving a certain idea of the city. And then he provides this very compelling definition. A city with a long history of cosmopolitanism, Venice is a thinking machine a thinking machine that allows us to ponder the very idea of the city. Citizenship practices, urban life as sediments of history, as the experience of the here and now, as well as a project for a possible future. The 500th anniversary of the ghetto was a unique opportunity to open a new phase in the history of the site and to highlight its global relevance through a modern approach to its heritage. We were convinced and we remain convinced that at the time of political uncertainty in Europe, the ghetto has precious ethical and cultural lessons to educate the public about the Jews, about human rights, cross-cultural and interfaith dialogue. This apparently marginal place in the world's most visited city is yet crucial for understanding how societies can engage in cross-cultural conversation to their mutual benefit. An indispensable factor will certainly be the preservation of its tangible heritage, so we still need to restore the synagogues, and there is an ongoing campaign for that. But to me, the most important thing was that also the intangible heritage, the people, the community, the culture needs to be preserved. So 2016 was a year of critical reflection, experiments, and creative reimaginings. We hosted symposia and lectures. You may recognize Simon Shama, who gave the keynote lecture uh, on the day of the anniversary, 29th of March. There's Mitchell Dunier here for uh, uh, a wonderful symposium called The Ghetto as Global Metaphor, where different ghettos around the world were compared. It was very important to say this is not just about Venice. It's about, you know, through Venice, you also think about other ghettos. We invited writers to rewrite the ghetto. The ghetto is not much represented by the classical canonical authors that are written about Venice. And so we invited a number of writers. I'm very pleased that Clive Sinclair is here, one of the many uh, uh, writers we, we invited to rethink through art and literature the ghetto. This is a picture of African-American poet Rita Dove, who came and reflected on the ghetto through her own experience of the African-American ghetto and responded particularly to Sarah Kopiusulam. So we're having a modern Jewish, sorry, a modern 
uh, a contemporary African-American poet that writes back, as it were, to, uh, in response to an early modern Jewish poet. We invited eight Jewish artists, led by uh, London artist Jacqueline Nichols, to honor the tradition of Jewish Venice as a capital of the Hebrew book to redesign a new Passover Haggadah, the books that you find in every uh, Jewish family that is used for Pesach or Passover. A very important one was printed in 1609, so we invited the artists to make a new version. And so they worked together and they lived with us for three weeks and they produced a magnificent work of art that should be published soon. And we also decided to tackle our ghost, Shylock, by staging the Merchant of Venice in the ghetto for the first time in history uh, with an international company and um, a director called Karen Kunrod, who took the very made, made the, the very bold decision of casting five different actors in the role of Shylock. You can see them in the top right picture. So five different actors in the same production, including a woman that had the famous hath not a Jewai speech. Um, and that was a very important moment. So if you re remember the early photos, the, you know, the, the Gafich, the Bosnian photographer's photo with its melancholy emptiness or the nostalgia of the black and white of Shanna, and against the masses, and you think of the cruise ships disgorging all the people, I would claim that the ghetto is not a place of the past, but it's a place of the present and of the future, an area that holds the promise of community. My last slide shows you a group of students with a professor engaging in a conversation at the Jewish Museum and a definition that comes from the Council of Europe that uh, defines a heritage community. What is a heritage community? Heritage community consists of people, no matter where they were born, no matter where they're from, people who value specific aspects of cultural heritage, which they wish within the framework of public action to sustain and transmit to future generations. Heritage communities are made of committed scholars, students, artists, actors, religious and cultural visitors, and I think that may help strike a vital balance between the resident community, the religious community, there are 400 odd members of the Jewish community, and all the other communities there. In this talk, I have used several metaphors and definitions for the ghetto, a site that refuses to become a monument demanding silent veneration palimpsest of different narratives, a screen where different myths and ideologies are projected, a danger zone, a comfort zone, a site of memory and a civic arena, a spiritual heaven and a religious battleground. But I would like to suggest at the very end that we should return to the original name, the ghetto, the foundry, no longer a factory for the melting of copper, but a factory for the production of new learning, new ideas, new art. And you're all invited to participate in a new era for the ghetto. Thank you.